Well, good afternoon everyone, and firstly my thanks to you for your attendance. Pleasure to see so many people. Uh, I'd like to particularly acknowledge those First Nations people who have served, are serving, or are planning to serve in our country, and in that sense we wish to acknowledge that particular group especially. I'd like to call on our event coordinator, Ron Lyons, to introduce our speaker and our topic. And Ron, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the eighth in our lecture series for 2023. Today's lecture is Defence Space Command, an introduction, and it'll be presented by Group Captain Stephen Henry, Royal Australian Air Force, the Director of Space Force Generation. Group Captain Henry graduated from ADFA in 1997. His first space-related posting was at the 2nd Space Warning Squadron, United States Air Force at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado in 2003 to 2005. His subsequent postings in this area of defence include establishing the Australian Space Operations Centre at Headquarters Joint Operations Command in 2008 to 2011, assisting in the development and application of the United States Defence Space Policy at the Pentagon in 2016-2017, the space capability development work at Air Force Headquarters in 2018 to 2019, and Commanding Officer of the Surveillance and Control Training Unit in 2020 to 22. With the establishment in Australia of Defence Space Command in January of last year, he became the Director of Space Force Generation. Would you please welcome Group Captain Steve Henry to the podium. Thanks very much, Ron, and, uh, and Michael for having me. Uh, certainly to, to Rusi for, for um, the outreach and engagement and education that, uh, that you value and, and for the tour um, earlier, uh, on which I got a, a bit of a taste of that. Um, uh, and also thanks to, to all of you here and, and all who, who may watch this uh, online. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and learn about a topic that I personally am quite passionate about, but also that, that my organisation, Defence Space Command and Defence more broadly, um, takes, takes very seriously. And a part of taking that seriously is raising the, the level of knowledge, not just within our organisation, but across government, across industry and academia and, and the community uh, more broadly. So I'm the Director of Force Generation at Space Command. Uh, what that means is that I'm, I'm responsible for the preparedness of our space forces, and we do have some. Um, I'm responsible for training and exercising those forces to prepare them to perform their role uh, in, in, uh, in defence. And finally, for assuring them through those training and exercises to make sure they're ready. And then when we get, find out that you know, we, we need to do more because we can always do better, we go back to the top of that, that virtuous cycle, do more training, exercising and assuring. So that's, that's the, uh, the, my role and I'm, uh, I'm grateful for it. It's, a, it's an excellent role. So it wouldn't be a, a military brief without discussing the, the mission and vision of the organisation. So our mission is to prepare space power to secure Australia's interests in peace and war. So importantly, I'll pull out a couple of parts of that mission. Space power is not strictly a military thing that means a single satellite or a single system out there doing a role. Space power is a measure of a nation's total capability to influence and shape a particular domain. So our role is to do so in the space domain. Australia's interest means far more broadly, again, than just military, diplomatic, informational, economic uh, aspects of national power. And all of our interests, agricultural, economic, uh, informational, uh, and finally, in peace and war. We are doing our job 24-7, 365 throughout the year um, in all phases of taking care of space and, and what it means in shaping that domain. Our vision is to assure Australian civil and military access in space, integrated across government and in concert with allies, international partners and industry. No one can do this alone. Okay? Even the US, with their huge uh, space complex, uh, understand the, the deep importance of partnerships, not just within the US across our own government and with their industry and academics, but also with Australia and their other allies and partners. We all recognise that together. Okay? We're, we're on a, a big sphere here that's spinning around uh, and, and no one nation has access to the whole thing. So just naturally by the, the nature of the domain, it is a, it is a team sport. 
And that's represented in our Space Command badge. So the badge itself is built around unity uh, and protection. Unity with industry, unity with academia, and unity with international partners and allies. Uh, the four stars there, uh, sorry, five stars of the, um, of the Southern Cross, you can see represent the three branches of the military, Army, Navy, and Air Force. We are heavily supported by public service and the whole of government. And then, of course, again, space, industry, and academia. Um, you know, our, our researchers, developers, builders, uh, who bring so much of that national capability uh, into, into our hands. But why is space so important? Well, the main reason is that space technology and services benefit all Australians. So much that we do today in our modern society, from banking to navigation to the internet, uh, all rely on, on space in different ways, whether it's the, the timing signal uh, from a global navigation satellite uh, system like GPS, um, or if it's a communication signal broadcasting uh, you know, various uh, signals that the nation might need. We rely on space so heavily in so many ways, and many of them are quite hidden. Uh, so that's uh, you know one of our great challenges is bringing that education so uh, people know that when the Uber is coming, the, the blue dot on the screen that's that's provided by space systems, and the same goes for emergency services and commercial transport. They're all all supported. Entire systems and cities are relied on space technologies. Losing access to space would impact not only Australia's national security, but also our way of life. For all of those reasons, all of those services would either be degraded or denied uh, in the event that we lost access to space and, and space signals and space services. And it's used widely across all sectors, and you can see they're just a, a brief representation of some of those. Weather predicting for, for safety and, and maritime uh, operations. Uh, navigation for, for all manner of, of services, and especially um, you know, things like emergency services there on that third icon. Financial uh, systems uh, are, are commonly timed by the GPS uh, signal. So for, for everything from making a transaction at the shops through to, to the major financial markets uh, are supported by GPS. Um, Using any sort of mobile technology there, you can see that the small device there on the, on the fifth icon, any sort of mobile technology, um, mobile networks are supported and timed by um, space signals uh, and supported by satellite communications. And finally, other industries that we really don't go straight to in our minds when we think about space, like agriculture, manufacturing, uh, national transport systems with, with vehicles and vessels and aircraft travelling all around the country are supported by space. So for us, it really is critical, and the Defence Strategic Review identified space as a key component of Defence's integrated warfighting capability. So you might be familiar with the term joint, where the services come together. Um, the, the new and more integrated version of that, sorry, is, is integrated, where our forces are multi-domain uh, and cross-domain by design and truly integrated at that design level. We understand the importance of uh, certainly we understand the importance of defending our, our oceans, our land, our skies, and our data in the in the cyber domain. But we also need to defend space because it is integrated with those other domains. Space is becoming more congested, contested, and competitive. So congested meaning there is just a lot more stuff up there, far more objects, not just operational spacecraft of which there are you know, around 8,000 now, and that number changes every single day but many hundreds of thousands of pieces of space debris um, that are a direct threat to those systems as well. Contested, meaning that nations, companies, are vying for power in the space domain. It's not a, it's not a benign vacuum where, where nothing happens. There is valuable real estate in space. Uh, there is valuable uh, electromagnetic spectrum, and we're all competing for a share of that, so for, for national interests. Um, and, and finally, competitive. Uh, certainly in, in financial markets and, and companies looking to, to make the most of it, you'll, you'll know names like SpaceX and, and Blue Origin and, and that sort of thing who are trying to uh, you know, really break open space industry. But companies like those and miniaturisation of technology and technological advances have opened up space to commerce like never before. So if so many more people have access to space to use it to, to make a buck or provide a service that the competition is rising quite quickly as well. And we must uh, defend our critical assets in space against space debris, collisions and destructive acts. 
That protection is founded on space, what we call space domain awareness. You might hear space situational awareness and even space surveillance and tracking, knowing where everything is up there, okay? Getting around it, you know, eight plus kilometres per second, um, you know, anything is a, is a bullet at that speed. But understanding what's up there, what's available, what's around my system, what is near it and what can influence it, and how can I optimise my system to get the best out of them. So space domain awareness is critical. So I've just grabbed a, a selection here of, of different, uh, you know, fairly recent news articles that show some of the, uh, the, the pervasiveness of space systems and where it crops up sometimes where you might not necessarily expect. So the top left image there, farmers crippled by satellite failure as GPS gu guided tractors drawing to a halt. Space technology is embedded so deeply into many of our systems that whether it's GPS timing, um, satellite communication based um, access services to provide um, maintenance uh, level uh, type activities on your spacecraft from the manufacturer. Um, it, can, it can have a genuine impact if GPS is denied or disrupted and that's on the agricultural uh, 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 industry there as an example. Um, certainly nations, you can see the second story down there, nations are determining ways, actively determining ways to influence the environment um, if not for their benefit then to our detriment. Okay, so uh, not only in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum there where you can see um, you know, there might be GPS jamming or anything like that, but the, the story there is about a recent uh, Russian anti-satellite missile test. Okay? It's, uh, you, know, you, can, you can fire a, a missile into space and destroy, destroy a spacecraft. Several nations have de demonstrated capability to do that. But when that happens, that missile and that spacecraft become many thousands of pieces of space debris uh, and are in effect missiles themselves. So it's considered quite irresponsible. Remote lockouts reportedly stopped Russian troops from using stolen Ukrainian farm equipment. So uh, Russian soldiers broke into a, a big John Deere factory uh, as they invaded Ukraine and stole about uh, $5 million worth of farm equipment and started driving it away. Uh, John Deere did not support that activity and used remote lockouts to switch off those vehicles so they couldn't be used. Okay? Is it, is it a maintenance service or is it a, a, is it a, a counter tractor service, you know? It all starts to get pretty blurry when space is so uh, heavily ingrained into our systems. Um, GPS signals jammed there with that, that vessel picture in the middle. Um, GPS signals are, are absolutely a, a, a key dependence for a lot of modern military systems, including on the seas. And when that goes away or is spoofed or disrupted so that someone might, might deliberately uh, guide you off target, uh, the results can be quite devastating. Satellite cyber attack paralyzes 11 gigawatts of German wind turbines. So this one, I think, uh, in addition to German wind turbines, when you look at the size and shape of Australia and how far apart things are, space is an ideal uh, means to communicate across vast distances across large systems with mining and power generation. It builds in a requirement to look after those links between your operations centre and your wind turbine or your road construction crew or your agricultural system or your mining system. So any of those things can be connected via space, which also needs to be a pro uh, protected. And then finally, uh, you can see uh, China's uh, Xi'an 21 tugs a dead satellite out of the geo belt. Uh, the geo belt I'll describe shortly, but it's a, it's a high value part of a, a piece of space terrain where a lot of the satellite communication systems are housed and, and weather systems and, and military systems. It's important when your spacecraft in this important piece of, of space domain is moved out of that belt, okay? So that you can put another one there because you don't want to leave debris. It would be like driving a car around and when it runs out of petrol, hopping out of it and leaving it there. Okay, so we like people to clean up the geo belt. Um, this Chinese example, a uh, spacecraft went up, used a net to grab its spacecraft and dragged it out into what we call the disposal orbit outside GEO. That's very responsible space behaviour. Okay, they were removing a, a, a Chinese satellite that wasn't working anymore. What else could they remove? These are the complex questions we need to ask. We've got very important um, military spacecraft and uh, communication spacecraft in that belt. If they can remove that one, it follows that they could remove others. So a lot of these dual use technologies and considerations that we, that we think about every single day. But where is space? All right, we, we talk about space and, and space, you know, certainly in, in, in military parlance for a long time was a lightning bolt 
on the screen that went up to a spacecraft that was always there and providing you services and you didn't have to worry about it. But that's just not the case anymore. So it's a, it's a physical place, just like air, land and sea, with its own unique characteristics, just like those other domains. There's actually no internationally legally accepted definition, okay? So what that means is that, the, you know, uh, for example, the uh, Australian Space Launches and Returns Act defines any object designed to go above 100 kilometres as a space object. Okay, so you could infer that that means over 100 kilometres is in space, but it doesn't say that. Okay, we, we, we use it as a, as a line. Um, US military space operations um, consider there's an area of operations above 100 kilometres, but that doesn't mean that that's where space starts and air finishes or anything like that. So it's, it's actually not very clearly defined. What folks generally use is something called the Kármán line. Okay, the Kármán line is at about 100 kilometres, and I say about 100 kilometres because it's based on the atmosphere and the atmosphere is dynamic, right? But at about 100 kilometres, you have to travel so quickly to generate lift over an aerofoil in an aircraft that you actually switch to orbital velocity. So it's a physical point of change. What do I mean by orbital velocity? It's the speed at 100 kilometres uh, altitude, which is about 8 kilometres per second forwards, that as you fall due to gravity, so if anyone, tell you, if anyone says zero gravity, don't accept it. If there was zero gravity, there'd be zero satellites because they just spear off into space. But that's the point at which you are travelling so quickly forwards that the rate you're falling is the same as the rate that the Earth is curving away from you anyway. So you're at orbital velocity. Okay? You're, you're, you're moving forwards as quickly as space uh, is... Uh, sorry, as, far, as quickly as the Earth is falling away and you're being drawn to it. So it's called free fall. You're actually in free fall. You're always falling towards something in space. In most of these examples that I use today, we're talking about Earth, right? But orbits now are extending out to Earth to Luna, around Luna, uh, Earth to Mars and around Mars. But we focus on, uh, on Earth today. With that said, if it's only 100 kilometres away, space is closer than Newcastle. All right? It's an interesting way to put it into perspective to think that it's actually not that far away. Military systems and other systems are moving overhead right now closer than Newcastle. Okay? We don't think about that. Now, there's not many at that altitude. It's a, it's a handy physical line to use, but there's still air there. There's still drag. It'll, it'll pull you down. But very quickly, as you get past that altitude, uh, you start to get into usable, sustainable orbits uh, where you can have um, effects, good or otherwise. So just taking a look at some of the common orbits that we use, the first one there that you'll see, uh, the, little, the little red circles around Earth, a low Earth orbit. A low Earth orbit extends from that 100 kilometre Kármán line out to 2,000 kilometres. A low Earth orbit is great because you're close to what you're trying to look at. So especially if you're trying to use a, an intelligence and surveillance system, you probably want to be in LEO. Okay, you're nice and close to the target, you can, you can get a good look at it. But it's got its problems. At that altitude, you're travelling at around 7.5 kilometres per second. So you'll pass overhead the point that you want to look at in about 10 minutes, uh, if you're passing directly overhead, uh, and then you'll be gone again. And it's not until some time later that you've done a couple of laps and the Earth has rotated beneath you that you get another look. So if you want persistent coverage, you need a lot of satellites in LEO. You can't see a lot of Earth from LEO. You can build a lot of satellites, and Starlink by SpaceX is proving that, right? They're putting up thousands of satellites to provide persistent internet over the entire surface of the Earth, okay? So it's not unachievable, but it's expensive. It takes thousands of spacecraft. Heading out further, beyond 2,000 kilometres, out to 35,786 kilometres, and I'll talk about that precise number shortly, is medium Earth orbit. So everywhere from 2000 out to that geosynchronous and geostationary orbit that you see is medium Earth orbit. And this is where you'll find uh, GPS, the US Global Positioning System, and other global navigation satellite systems. China's Beidou is an equivalent to GPS. Russia's GLONASS, um, the EU's Galileo, uh, and other systems. They're at about 20,000 kilometres altitude. At that distance, you haven't got great resolution with a camera, but you can cover the entire Earth, like GPS wants to, with far fewer satellites, with 24 to 32 satellites. Okay, that's a lot better than thousands. Okay? Your power isn't as strong, and there, and there are trade-offs, but you get to, but you get to uh, access the entire planet with far fewer spacecraft. And then you've got geosynchronous orbit. Geosynchronous orbit, also known as, as, the, as the Clark Belt, is at 35,786 kilometres, and at the equator, you're orbiting once every 23 hours and 56 minutes, which is a day. 
So to an observer on the Earth, you appear fixed in the sky. There are massive benefits to this orbit, and that's why it's really valuable real estate. It means that a, you know, a, a tradie can come to my house and put a satellite dish on my roof and point it at the sky, at something I can't see, and it'll just sit there and do its job and use that spacecraft, okay? They're like fixed, fixed points in the sky. Really, really easy to set up, really easy to track, and they provide you persistent coverage over that part of the Earth. Really, really valuable real estate. Geosynchronous orbit is similar. It's, it, it orbits at the same period, but it's a little bit inclined and takes a little bit of tracking. And then you've got Molniya orbit. Uh, a challenge with geosynchronous orbits is that you, you can't see the poles. You know, Earth, Earth being a sphere, you, sort of, you start to scrape it uh, when you're looking from that far away at about 78 degrees. So uh, the Russians, who mostly live above 78 degrees, uh, designed what is called a, a Molniya orbit, which, which covers those northern, uh, northern reaches uh, more effectively and for about the same number of spacecraft. All of this to say that you know, a satellite ain't a satellite ain't a satellite. You need, to, you need to design your system, your sensors, your constellation of spacecraft to serve whatever particular mission you like, whether it's intelligence from LEO, global positioning and navigation from uh, MEO or uh, persistent coverage and communications from GEO. It all needs to be balanced. And of course, it's all connected very, very closely to the Earth. If I'm in geosynchronous orbit, I can only see one side of the planet at any one time, so my ground stations and my customers and the people I'm serving need to be on that same side of the Earth. If they're not, I need to find a way to get around to the other side. This is just another diagram. What I, what I like about this one is the Earth's radius there is 6,378 kilometres, so that's, that's half of the Earth that you can see there. Spacecraft are one sixty-third of that hemisphere off the surface. So you can imagine how small that is on this scale, it's sort of the biggest scale that you can get on a, on a, uh, on a slide. But that distance to space is, is really small. It is close uh, and it is uh, you know, right up where we need to be. And you can see medium Earth orbit there as well between Leo and Geo uh, and Geo out there, how, how far that is to scale. So that describes the space environment and where space is itself and why we want to use it and how we might use it. This is how we bring it to Earth and how we access space. So space systems, we, uh, we refer to them as having four segments. The space segment is the first place everyone mind, everyone's mind goes to when you talk about space. The satellites, the vacuum, the images of the International Space Station uh, that we all um, are familiar with. But the space segment is only one of them. The ground segment is a segment that operates those satellites. So it's the people, the systems, the engineering, everything that's going on to keep those spacecraft functioning, to monitor their temperature, their voltage, their power, their pointing, their orbit, keeping them where they are, all happens in what we call the ground segment. So that is a part of an integral part of your space system. But then you have the user segment, and the user segment is massive and it is diverse, and it's everything from an individual walking around with a, a, a phone or a, a piece of equipment in their hand that has a GPS chip in it, okay, right up to you know, massive aircraft, ships, facilities, um, interconnected systems wherever they are on or near Earth. Okay? The user system, uh, the user segment is, is massive. And I should mention that the user segment actually extends into, oh, excuse me, actually extends into space. Okay? Spacecraft use spacecraft. Whether that's uh, spacecraft below GPS, using GPS for navigation and, and, and knowing where they are or timing, um, or whether it's uh, satellite in, uh, satellites in low Earth orbit, using ones in medium Earth orbit and geo to communicate their signals back to another part of the Earth that they can't see right now. Okay? So spacecraft use other spacecraft as well. And finally, tying all of this together is the link segment. We like to say that all spacecraft are communication spacecraft. Okay? Something that is orbiting 100 to many thousands of uh, kilometres above the Earth is absolutely useless to me unless I can get a signal to it and it can get a signal to me. And all of that is happening in the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay? So for us, the electromagnetic spectrum is a resource and a key part of the space domain that we have to protect to assure our access to those space systems. The link segment does include hard lines, etc., on the ground as well. You can see between the, the segments on the ground there and the user segment absolutely includes hard lines, whether they be oceanic cables, um, copper, optical fibre uh, between, between facilities here on Earth. But you know, 
we, we always have to remember that just because we're talking about the space domain doesn't mean we're talking about in space. Okay? It extends into all of the other uh, traditional domains as well, the physical domains. So some key differences between space and the other domains. One is that gravity dominates motion, uh, sorry, gravity dominates motion in space, not friction or pressure. Okay? So here on Earth, when we're getting around, we use our feet or we paddle around in the water or whatever, we're pushing against something. It's natural, we get it. All right, we move around, we know that we're in an aircraft, there's air flying over wings, they're pushing against surfaces, and these are all things that we can understand just by our common human experience. So on land, sea and air, we can do all these things and we can stop. Okay? The environment is also dominated by terrestrial weather. Rain, fog, wind, temperatures, snow, you know, water in all of its forms in the atmosphere dominate the uh, environment. In space, gravity results in constant orbit orbital motion, which is often counterintuitive. It's hard to, we can't think naturally about space. We can't think about something that moves at eight kilometers per second. All right, it just doesn't come up all that often. All right, so these things are moving at spectacular speeds, but they can't stop. So the, the gravitational topography of space, as we call it, means that you know, there are valuable parts of space, there are ways to use it, and the environment itself is dominated by space, which is solar weather. So it's not a benign vacuum, it's not, you don't just put something up there and it's, and it's just sitting there doing its thing. It's dealing with charged particles, with atmosphere, with atomic oxygen, um, solar flares, all sorts of things are going on up there that you need to defend your system against and understand. These differences are one of the many reasons that we need space professionals and why I'm in a job, right? It's why I get to do all of this training and exercising of these space forces to grab the, the, the women and men of our defence forces and government and partners uh, and bring them together to try and understand this, um, this domain. Um, but as I said, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive in a lot of ways. But there are, of course, key similarities. We are 100% a part of the joint and integrated force. Okay? You can't think about space operations without thinking about air, maritime, land and cyber operations. Okay? They all go together naturally. We're all subject to the same international humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict. Okay? Space is not a wild west. You might hear that come up in the media every now and then. Space is a wild west. The law is certainly developing, which is, which is what that wild west refers to, but there is no doubt that according to the Outer Space Treaty that, that we are a signatory to, that international law applies. Okay? Uh, and, we, and we follow that as a responsible user. All of the domains contribute to national power across diplomatic, informational, military and economic dimensions. Okay? Again, you can't talk about space and military without talking about how Australian industry might be involved. You can't develop a complex space system without considering how the information of doing that might affect your power relative to other nations. Um, and of course there are um, uh, diplomatic aspects to that as well. All of those activities are subject to our national law, policy and values. We don't get to do what we want in space, just like we don't get to do what we want uh, willy-nilly any, anywhere else. It's subject to, you know, in a, in a liberal democracy like Australia, it's subject to the, to, the, to the will of the people, to the government of the day, and we, we, what we want to get out of it, just like all of the other domains. And, of course, in any domain, effects can be achieved in, to, from or through any other domain. If I want to deny an enemy access to a, a space system or, or degrade one of their space systems, perhaps the best way to do so is with a strike on one of their ground stations and, and to take out an antenna or something like that. Maybe it's a, a, a jamming effect in a particular area where I don't want them using GPS or satellite communications. None of that's occurring in space, but it's occurring in the space domain, in one of those other segments. Okay? So we absolutely extend uh, all of those domains can be affected uh, uh, from, from each other. So space is certainly not a panacea. No one should be telling you that now that we can do space, all future wars are solved. We can do space. We've got, we've got, it, we've got it under control. Okay? It's not the case with any domain. None of them is a panacea. All of them are an essential element of the integrated force. So all of that said, our role at Defence Space Command, we're established to deliver the transformational change uh, needed across defence to consolidate space capabilities and operations. 
Uh, we've been doing space for, for quite a long time. Space Command was formed in, in January last year, but that's just a recognition of the, of the importance, the increasing importance of, of space, not just to our military, but to our nation, uh, and also its impact on military operations and our uh, modern national security and way of life. Transformational because, you know, it, it hasn't been managed as an individual domain before. We haven't generated the forces as a, as a, as a separate uh, interest with people out there dedicated to this day in and day out. That's what we have now. Okay. So it's, a, it's a transformational change for the organisation. The defence space strategy, how we're getting there, uh, we have five key lines of effort. So we, uh, our first line of effort is to enhance defence of space capability to assure joint force access in a congested, contested and competitive space domain. So recognising that our integrated force relies on space for all of these services, understanding that dependence and assuring access to those services that they need. Our second line is to deliver military effects integrated across whole of government with allies and partners in support of a nation, national security, sorry, Australia's national security. It is 100% a team effort, okay? We cannot do this alone. We will be doing it with the rest of the military and the rest of the government, the rest of our national power and our international allies and partners. Why I'm here today, line of effort three, increase the national understanding of the criticality of space. Okay, back to that national values, policies and law. Until people understand the criticality of space and how we're reliant we are on it in our modern way of life, um, you know, no one's going to care too much about it. Okay? We have a, a space agency now, we have a Defence Space Command. The, the nation is, is recognising and getting on board with how important this is. To advance Australian sovereign space capability to support the development of a sustainable national space enterprise. So we talk about partnering with, with international allies and partners, but how do we make sure that in that partnership, Australia is rising its industry and value as well to make a meaningful contribution? Okay? And we do in many regards. We have world-leading engineers and scientists spread across the country in highly relevant disciplines, like um, uh, a couple of good examples, RF. Australians are great at radio frequency science and technology. But another one that doesn't leap to mind all the time is remote operations. We do a lot of mining from remote locations. So who do you want to talk to if you want to go to the moon and set up a base and maybe use local resources to do that? You talk to the Australian mining industry. They've been doing this stuff for years. It doesn't matter that it's on the moon. They're good at this stuff. It might as well be on the moon, right, you know, in, in large parts of Western Australia. The, the, the skills and the applications are exactly the same. And then finally, we have to evolve the defence space enterprise to ensure uh, a coherent, efficient and effective use of the space domain, making sure that the command and control, the governance mechanisms, the uh, expenditure of valuable resources, both in terms of, of humans and, and, and uh, money, are contributing in a coherent fashion to what we need uh, in, in defence. So our priorities against those lines of effort, first and foremost, space workforce. We need more people doing this stuff. It's not an Air Force role, it's not an Army role, it's not a Navy role. It is absolutely a joint endeavour and we are building uh, a joint space command and space units built of the entire, um, uh, entire defence uh, yeah, enterprise. APS um, as, as well are absolutely included in that. Um, we're developing right now a defined career path for space professionals. I'm an air battle manager by trade. I haven't done a heck of a lot of air battle management in my career because I've been busy doing space stuff. Um, that is you know, a lot of good luck, uh, a little bit of good management, but you know, we find ourselves with not that many dedicated space professionals. It is growing really quickly and we need to get better at managing those humans so that they can make that meaningful contribution to capability. Space operations are, are a priority. Using what we have now to best effect defining what we need in the future to do those space operations. Having a resilient capability, being able to do something is great, being able to do it when it's trying to be denied or contested is a whole different challenge. Okay? Not only by a potential you know, adversary actor, but also by the domain itself, that's space weather. What's going on with my space system? Is it space weather or is someone messing with it in the electromagnetic spectrum? Understanding those things are important. All in the context of a rules-based framework. Um, and then finally, international interagency and industry partners. We are working really hard uh, to grow these partnerships to the benefit of both parties to those partnerships. So being a good partner 
and making a contribution, but also looking for you know what can what can other nations do for us, what can industry do for us, so that we can all rise on the same tide. Some achievements to date. So we have released Australia's first defence space strategy. That happened last year. Uh, that's available online. We developed uh, the Defence Space Strategic Workforce Plan um, and established uh, you know, Defence Space Command January last year uh, for the headquarters uh, and, and related functions, operations, capability and um, strategic uh, policy, strategy and policy. We've established a lot of space engagement talks with international partners. Um, I, I cannot foot stomp the importance of cooperation enough. Uh, we spend a lot of time um, you know, with our partners determining how best to move forward. Uh, the US Space Force is some eight or 12,000 people, right? How do our you know, two to 300 work with that behemoth, behemoth sorry, effectively to get what we need out of it? Okay? We have to prioritise and make sure we're getting the, the most we can out of those relationships. And the same goes for our other partners in you know, UK, Canada, New Zealand uh, and throughout Asia-Pacific. Um, participation in exercises, including the Shriva War Game, which is a whole of government um, uh, gathering, Talisman Sabre, so that the, the huge joint and integrated and, and coalition uh, exercise that we do every year has space in it now. Asterex is, a, is a, a French version of Talisman Sabre. Uh, Sprint Advanced Concept Training is a, um, an innovative uh, space domain awareness activity where we invite industry and international partners to join us in, in developing new ways of surveying the space domain to develop space domain, domain awareness. All of that with our allies and partners. And finally, capability and operational achievements including the establishment of number one space surveillance unit at RAF Edinburgh and a space component, a Joint Operations Command, okay? meaning that the space domain is recognised as one of the five critical domains to operations. We've now got a space component out there as well, reporting to the, directly to the uh, Chief of Joint Operations day to day. Ladies and gents, I tried to pack a fair bit in there and I don't want to get in the way of the AGM. Uh, remember, there are no roles that haven't been filled, so please stick around. But uh, I'll try to leave a little bit of time for, for discussion and questions, if you like. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, a very, very important journalist and a class in the Aviation Week. Uh, can you give us some numbers? Imagine just about your biggest challenge is simply getting together people. Yep. Um, because we have next to no, we have very little space background in this country. So how many people do you have and how many people do you need by a certain time? Great question. So yeah, look I um Exact numbers are, are, are tough to come by, but the, the command itself is, is only about two hundred people absolutely dedicated right now. Um, but it goes so far beyond that in, in terms of integration. So um, just, just because, because someone isn't, uh, you know, isn't specifically posted to Defence Space Command, I think there might be another microphone. Am I doing? Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, doesn't mean that people aren't in a space role. You identify a really excellent point, and that is that Australia doesn't have a huge um, space industry. Um, so, you know, if, if I need army drivers or, or pilots or anything like that. Australia has drivers and pilots and that sort of thing. So we consider the growth of space capability uh, and space talent to be a, a national project. Um, certainly within defence we're looking at ways to um, broaden our pool. How do we, how do we break down barriers? You know, I don't want to go around saying, hey, we will only take Air Force air battle managers like myself, okay? That'd be crazy because we've still got air battle management functions to do and if I said that then you know, there'd be a natural tension. So what our focus is on is not on who is uh, you know, specifically a space person. Who can we uh, educate and develop to do their role in a way that contributes to space power in whatever role they might find themselves in? So yeah, the, the numbers are very tough to put your finger on because space is so pervasive throughout the force. Deal with robot race 
in space, what's the framework for that? And what do you define as aggression within space? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, good question. So, um, space is not lawless. Uh, there are plenty of laws uh, around, and those are mostly based on the five space treaties. The Outer Space Treaty is the main one, and then you've got others relating to um, the Moon, Rescue, um, uh, and, and, and other treaties. Those are all in, in part of the international framework. It is then up to each nation to contextualise that international treaty, if they've signed up, I think still, is that microphone still on? Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting feedback. It's not okay. Um, it is up to nations, based on their national policies, laws, and values, to then contextualise those to implement their space laws. And Australia has those, and they've, we've had laws for a while, but they've been quite um, uh, developed and, and grown through the Australian Space Agency over the last, you know, geez, five years now. Um, how do we deal with rogue actors? Uh, we haven't had to all that much yet. Certainly, um, in the international context, nations will fine um, their people. So if a nation issues a licence to a space company and the, and the company doesn't comply with that licence, that nation is responsible for fining them. Um, there has not been a lot of law tested in, in outer space, for example, if two spacecraft collide. Um, the law is, is not well tested. So. And, and there are a lot of political and, and, and legal reasons for that, but it is hard to deal with rogue actors unless they break your international law and, and you're willing to hold them responsible. Um, and sorry, that was the other half, wasn't it? Was, was how do you deal with rogue actors? Oh, how, how do you find aggression in space? Um, great question, because it's not, a, it's, it's not like uh, you can say, hey, your spacecraft is too close to my spacecraft, right? As long as it's not colliding with it or, or, or impacting its operations, who's to say how close is too close? And it just comes down to... Uh, what we refer to as responsible behaviours and rules of the road. Uh, with spacecraft travelling at, you know, 8 kilometres per second in LEO, 3.5 kilometres per second in GEO, really getting too close, you know, hundreds of kilometres can be too close at those speeds. So it's just up to each party to provide a certain amount of judgement and responsible behaviour and to communicate uh, and build trust to help each other understand that, hey, I don't, I don't like that, that's too close uh, for my liking. Yeah, how do we how do we get around this? Uh, and then you, you know, using space domain awareness, countries might call each other out for irresponsible behaviours. You'll see that come up in the media every now and then. So it's, a lot of it's about uh, information and diplomacy uh, at the moment. Paul's very nice space You define uh, the operations of space and the whole government and the whole country. Yep. How close? Does the Australian Space Agency need to operate with uh, Defence Space Command to achieve the latter's objectives? Um, it's very disappointing to see that the government did not receive the acquisition of four sovereign satellites. So, how soon is a sovereign capability? And lastly, I don't think we can find as anyone, including Elon Musk, who provided space based. Absolutely. Look, um, the relationship between um, the Australian Space Agency uh, and Defence Space Command is, is absolutely important. And we each have a liaison officer um, in, in, uh, in our own uh, headquarters. Um, so both are important. For us, that's important because, you know, uh, in addition to the way that we do uh, capability projects, a large part of the Space Agency's remit relates to Australian commercial activities. So there are just naturally overlaps in, in our interests. Um, uh, another good example, space domain awareness. So we, we take space domain awareness to, for, for military purposes and protecting our systems and, and seeing what's going on up there. Um, the Space Agency uses space domain awareness for, for other purposes like compliance and, um, and, and again, understanding the environment. So uh, a lot of the ways that the uh, agencies and, and departments interact are just because there are, there are natural um, overlaps in, in our interests. Um, the next one was the, the, the decision not to purchase four sovereign satellites. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about the, the National Space Mission um, Earth Observation. Um, 
Look, I, I mentioned at the start there, we, we are in a liberal democracy where um, you know, both of those departments uh, serve at the, at the will of the government of the day. And you know, as we further learn and educate about space, the, the priorities are, are, are prone to shift at different times depending on, on what the nation needs. So um, I'm sure some folks are disappointed that didn't go ahead, but um, you know, space projects are like any other project. They, they, they come and go depending on the priorities of, of the day. Um, and then finally, uh, the idea that you know, someone in a suit has space power. Absolutely. Uh, that is part of the congested, contested and competitive. Um, in addition to the fact that the company may have a licence to do things, um, that doesn't mean they have to do them all the time. And companies can, can supply or withdraw services based on their values or what their government might encourage them to do, you know, where they operate and where they're housed. Um, the integration of, of commercial and military and national systems is part and parcel of the space domain. You'll, you'll often hear the term dual use. So, you know, all of these different systems, whether it's SATCOM, position navigation and timing, earth observation, they all have dual uses uh, that can be, you know, given and, and taken away depending on the, the values of the, of the person who controls them. But, yeah, it's, it's a great point. John Hitchin, I was on New South Wales. So the young Australian man and woman must progress to your position. What would be typical career as in the graduate of Australian politics? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the, for the question, John. It's a, a huge part of my role at the moment. I mentioned space workforce, training and defined career paths. The Defence Strategic Review recognises that we need to start having dedicated space professionals uh, or, or, or people with a career path in space in our organisation now. We don't have enough now and we're looking to grow that quite rapidly. You don't have to join the military to do that. We work with um, government, industry, um, all, you know, all of those all the time. And it's really important to note that, that you know, space companies are everywhere and they might not necessarily think of themselves as space companies. I mentioned RF. Um, or radio frequency operations and um, uh, what was the other example? Remote mining earlier. Not what you think of as space industries, okay? But making key contributions to our space capability right now. So as far as being a space professional is concerned, I would say pursue your passion and find a way to put space in the middle of the sentence, uh, to, to, to quote a friend from, uh, from ANU. Um, you know, I'm using aeronautical engineering uh, in a space system to improve environmental monitoring. I am using my um, remote sensing degree on a space system to aid in the mitigation of natural disasters. So I would say uh, follow your passion. If it's in the military, come on over. That'd be great. We need people doing that sort of thing and, it, and, it's, and it's excellent. Um, but the opportunities are bound um, and I would encourage people to keep like I said, space in the, in the middle of the sentence. How do I use my passion and my qualifications and my training to apply to a, a space context? Because the opportunities are, are endless. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to thank on your behalf, uh, Steve, for a very uh, insightful and important uh, presentation today. Um, He's shed some light on what to many of us is a considerable mystery uh, and uh, is affected by our limited knowledge that most citizens possess of the subject uh, that's been gleaned from fictional depictions uh, in movies and TV screens. So Steve, thank you for uh, uh, letting us into Space Command and uh, an exciting new, new area. And we'd like to... Uh, present you with uh, an RUSI tie. Unsurprisingly, it's the blue one. <laughs> <laughs> and a, uh, a one-year honorary membership certificate oh, of RUSI. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank Steve Henry, the fourth generation, was given our lunchtime oration.
Let's give a big hand to Defence Space, space Command for improving our space education.